Hello, everybody. Welcome to Broadway.com's Live at Five. It is January 28th. It is really it? is. That's it. <laughs> I'm Beth Stevens. <laughs> I'm Paul Lentore. And we're here with Caitlin Moynihan. Hello. Hey, Hi. Beth. Yes. Who's here today? Matthew Ament is here Ooh. from Dracula. And Ooh. guess what? He plays Dracula. Prince of Dark. Is that a Prince of, Prince of Darkness? Who's we'll the Prince of out. Darkness? We'll sure. Sure. <laughs> it's we know darkness. a lot about this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Uh, we will get to him shortly, but first, our top five. It seems like every day we got we're getting closer and closer to seeing Tick Tick Boom, and I'm okay with it. It's stressing me out on Caitlin, screen because I'm so excited to see Tick Tick Boom on screen. And they're on, on screen. On yeah, Lin Manuel Miranda think. is directing a movie version of Tick Tick Boom. We talk about it all the time for Netflix. Lynn, get to work. Get it done. Like, can we just see it already? Stop I mean, watching this, Lynn, and I, go to work. I feel like, you know, it's not going to come out. Like, In the Heights is going to come out way before. This is like a year away. But okay. it's exciting. That's fair. So we found out some new cast members. Of course, I like always reminding people that Andrew Garfield is playing John, a.k.a. Jonathan, Jonathan Larson. Larson. Mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa Hudgens is Caressa. Carissa, so the original Caressa. musical. She's, she's going to sing Come to Your Senses. She's okay. like the character because of it. Anyway, don't worry about it. Robin de Jesus is Michael, and Alexander Ship is Susan, the girlfriend. So now yes. we found out. Check this out. So Josh Henry, three-time Tony nominee Josh Henry, uh, will play Roger. Now, these are the, the show only had three actors in it. So these are all additional things. Uh, and he, of course, is known for Carousel, Violet, Scottsboro Boys, Tony nominations for those things. Uh, Judith Light. Come Broadway's on. Godmother. Come on. Judith Light is playing Rosa Stevens, and she, of course, won two Tony Awards for some fancy plays. But we don't plays, know who Rosa she Stevens is. Parent, and she was on show. show people and made my day last year. <laughs> we'll just um, and check this out. So Bradley Whitford, who you probably know from The West Wing and Handmaid's Tale and Transparent, he's playing Stephen Sondheim, who, of course, is like a mentor to Jonathan Larson. Correct. So this is great. Just get it done, Lynn. Just get it done. Thank you. I love this. <laughs> and the stars are coming out to Carnegie, Ho Carnegie Hall this season. All right, I'm going to do this rundown for you because it's a lot of people we love. Okay. And I want to give them all their due. Okay. So six Broadway favorites have been oh. announced for the 2020-21 New York Pops season at this, Carnegie Hall. This didn't used to happen. It happens now because it's the Broadway people. So it's so great, them. but I feel like Broadway people didn't get to always sing at Carnegie Hall years ago. But it happens so much mm -hmm. now. I love it. Are you going to tell a joke? No. Okay, good. Um, so Norm Lewis. Oh. Tony nominated Norm Lewis will open the season on October 16th, singing selections from his vast career. <laughs> Does this say that? No, I've made that up. Oh, okay. Uh, Danae Benton, who we all know from The Great Comet, will join Corey Cott and, and, Hamilton. Judith, and Hamilton, of course, uh, and Judith Clerman's Essential Voices USA for the name of this uh, concert is called This Land Was Made for You and Me. Oh, I know that song. You, you've heard of it. On November 13th, 2020. And that, of course, will salute the songs that have defined America. Uh -huh. And you can define mm. that any way you want, so it could be quite interesting. Laura Osnes, Broadway's sweetheart, oh, will ring in the holidays. <laughs> always at Carnegie she's Hall. She has like a dressing front. room there. She has the gowns there already. She, she's, she fits in the season. She will ring in the holiday season with her concert, Merry and Bright. Fun. On December 18th and 19th, together with Essential Voices USA, she will perform traditional carols, you know, holiday stuff. And then current West Side Story star Isaac Powell wow. and Tony winner Ali Stroker will team well, up for March 5th for the New York Pops Variety Hour. I mean, well, wow, I think we're just going to have to move Tony into Carnegie Hall. They by might. the time that happens. You never know. You, you never, never know. know. Good stuff. And in a crazy turn of events, we got Fun and Dr. Seuss coming together for a musical... Yeah, so I'm a big Dr. Seuss fan. I thought you were going to say you're a big fun fan. I'm a big fun fan. Uh huh. And sure also a big Jodie Pietro fan. So all these things are coming together. So If I Ran the Circus is a new musical based on the Dr. Seuss book of the same name. And so Jodie Pietro, who of course won a Tony for Memphis, and his new musical Diana, about the princess, um, is starting on Broadway very soon. He's collaborating with Nate Roos, uh, the front man of the indie group Fun, on this new musical. They did a reading last week. Nobody invited us. Um, <laughs> Darko Tresnik, who did Anastasia. And won a Tony for Gentleman's Guide to Love Thank and Murder. Thank you. He's directing. Um, and what else? Uh, well, so there's the co wrote the, Joe wrote, co wrote the lyrics with pop songwriter Jeff Basker who wrote the music with Roos. So, so he's the third member of this team. Mm -hmm. And this is a book about a little boy named Morris McGurk, 
God love Dr. Susie Seuss. Name. Who tries to recreate his father's favorite circus in an attempt to bring his fragmented family Aww. back to. Together. Oh, it's heartwarming. And Andy Lefkowitz, our news editor, talked to Joe. Yeah. And he said it's not going to be rhyming couplets. It's not going to be like your Susicles or your Grinches. Susicle, I saw it's, that. We saw that. But <laughs> it's not going to be like that. It's going to be a little bit different, a little bit more mature, maybe. Even oh. though there's an 11 year old at the center of it. I think it's going to make us cry. Probably. <laughs> so, anyway, next time you do a reading, let us know. And if not, just come right to Broadway. <laughs> yes. And we're giving you guys the scoop mm. on what Beth Level really thinks about Meryl Street. All right, we've said this before. So Beth that Level, <laughs> Tony winner, yes. Beth Level, uh, is going to be the star of the new coming upcoming musical, The Devil Wears Prada. Mm. And Meryl Streep mm -hmm. has taken on Beth Level's role in the prom film version. Yes, which, which is filming, filming right now. It's like right wrapping now. soon. She's playing Dee Dee Allen. So we talked to Beth, and she said, quote, if you're going to give your child to someone, I think Meryl's probably the best person because she developed that character mm -hmm. from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So she mm -hmm. has a lot of emotional attachment to it. Yeah. And uh, she said, also said, I just want to quote her because she's so, I mean, come on, it's Beth Level. Are we all not Beth Level heads, level fans, level super fans? She said, now Meryl and I are two degrees of separation. I do hope I get to meet her. Yep. If she's in Midtown, I would like a cup of tea or if she just has to go to the bathroom, please call me. <laughs> so so her number Street is. No. is in the Times Square area and has Correct. to go to the bathroom. Call Beth Level. Just call Beth. She'll work it out for you. <laughs> I love that. That's really helpful. What a, what a sweet thing to say. It is very sweet. I pref I really appreciate the camaraderie. It's it's lovely. Mm -hmm. She's a lovely person. And happy first performance, Jordan Fisher. Well, that's it. Happy first performance, Jordan <laughs> Fisher. You're now in Dear Evan Hansen, and you're playing Evan Hansen. I hope you know your lines. Um, I'm sure he does. <laughs> he's a pro. He won Dancing with the Stars. Um, he's at the Music Box Theater tonight. And, of course, Andrew Barth Feldman. Uh, ended his run over the weekend, and Jordan Fisher made his Broadway debut in Hamilton uh, in 2016. I first met him on the set of Grease Live. Yeah. I got to drive in a golf cart with Aaron Tveit and Jordan Fisher. That you're was very, fun. You're very special. Um, and he was also in Rent Live, which was a year ago yesterday, mm -hmm. correct? A year ago yesterday, he played Mark Cohen in that. Um, he's fantastic and a really nice guy. He's going to be there for at least 16 weeks. He starts tonight. Break a leg. Oh, yeah. Or an armor. That's the thing, right? Where's the cast? <laughs> you will be found. You will be found, Jordan Fisher. Also on the site, we have a club, Broadway.com, with we a do. Ms. Tour, Javert, Preston Truman Boyd. Stars. It's he that sings one. that, but a little bit different. That song. We have a new episode of our Phantom vlog, Face Off. Face Face which off. side is it? It's this, this side. Okay. With Ben yep. Crawford. Mm -hmm. And we got to meet the stars of Six, the musical. How many are there? Hmm. Sorry. The Ex-Wives Club. <laughs> you are so silly today. And, it's been a long uh, so day, Beth. It's been a very long And you know long what? Long Dracula's day. here. The Prince Dracula. of Darkness. Prince of Darkness him. is here, so thank you, Paul. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Caitlin, please tell us about our guest. Gladly. Yes, guys, we got Matt Ammon here today with us. He is currently, you know, the titular role in Dracula at the Classic Stage Company. This has been adapted by Kate Hamill, so it's got a really got a lot of fun new stuff happening. He made his Broadway debut in Bernhardt Hamlet. You guys may have seen him on the boards there. And he's previously been seen on stage in Hollywood, Much Ado About Nothing, and a lot of other great things. You guys can follow him on social media at Matthew Ammon and leave all of your questions in the comments down below. Please welcome Matt and Beth. Oh, lots of applause today. Thank you, Caitlin. Hey, Hello, Prince of Darkness. Thank you, yes. I prefer Lord of the Realm of Hell, but okay. you know, Prince of Darkness you is know, all right. There are a lot of options, oh, no, aren't it's there? True, there's so many. Now, this is not... <laughs> look, I'm not that familiar with Dracula. I read sure. it in high school. I've seen some movies, but there's a whole vampire either, really. genre out mm -hmm. there in the world sort of sparked by Dracula. Yeah, do you have a favorite? Did you have a favorite I vampire? Don't personally, but I'm sure all of you do. I know you do. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. But this is a, a gothic horror novel so mm -hmm. it's written in the Victoria era, era mm -hmm. by Bram Stoker. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I read it again for the first time, maybe. Again for the first time. I think I had peeked through it in high school. But you know, it's really like the Blair Witch Project of like <laughs> Dickensian in England, sort of. It's like it's all written in diaries and newspaper articles. Right, letters. And and letters like back and mm -hmm. forth. So it has this really creepy feeling that you're sort of like... Spying? Spying on the story or that it had just happened that afternoon, which I found really... Really interesting. And then Kate Hamill sort of took it and put her spin on it, which is such a wonderful Right, so that's voice. what makes this version really different, is 
They're yeah. calling it a feminist revenge story. Yeah, and so they. You so know, that's they, not the original at all. It's kind of a sexist story. Yeah, they story needed some the dudes to take revenge on, and they they found me, and um, <laughs> there. Uh, yeah, there's lots of revenge being had. But yeah, I think it's you know the story is so uh, the. Refresh us of, about the story. Refresh us. Well, you know, so I'm Dracula living in Transylvania, deciding that I need to get some fresh blood, that times are changing a little bit, and I need to move to London. And I become sort of involved with a, a family called the Harkers. And in the original story, that's really a kind of really creepy misogynist story of kind of getting these young women, and they misbehave with me, which kills them. And it's so kinda, Kate's yeah. put her uh, Kate's put her twist on that and changed all of that, which is the great fun of of her work to figure out what, how can we kind of reclaim these stories and take them back a little bit and still have a really good time. Do you want to tell us a little more about the twist? Well, you know, I think you should come down and come see us at Classic it. Stage. Come to Thirteenth Street. You'll <laughs> have like a good it. time. Yeah. Now you're kind of the go-to classic guy. You've done so much Shakespeare. That's very nice of you to say. Thank I think you. You also sort of like like to play the title role. <laughs> you played Hamlet. I have played Hamlet twice, you Henry V. Yeah. yeah, a lot of those guys, Troilus and, and Cressida. It's in your contract? I do only two title roles, yes, that's really, <laughs> I won't, yeah. Yeah, I have nothing but that, thank you. But in this version, it's, it's modernized, right? You're not speaking in a, tell me how the language is. Well, the language, one. you know, I mean, Kate, the allure for me of the project was, Kate is so brilliant at taking a period piece, maintaining a sense of period, and then creating these like incredible contemporary anachronisms. And when we're in rehearsal, you know, she talks a lot about, on this project, she talked a lot about Ghostbusters, the film from the 80s, where you have this kind of sense of um, a kind of humor and a, and a terror in it somehow, and the balance of those two things, a kind of dry comedy that's mixed with some genuinely fearful imagery and, and um, kind of threading this needle of being scared pleasurably if that makes sense. I love that. And uh, that's been great fun to work on. So yes, the, ostensibly we are in some sort of Victorian England in this play, but it's filled with uh, very, very contemporary jokes. And um, like most of her work, a sort of really deeply contemporary silliness with those old stories that seem so so silly, frankly, and dated. Yeah. Right, you're really selling, selling, it this, it, selling the, us on this because Ghostbusters. I yeah, mean, I'm there. Yeah. you know, we're having a great time, and the audiences <laughs> have been cheering and booing, and, and hissing, you're biting necks still. I am biting necks, but it's bloodless. several things. Yeah, it's a bloodless Dracula. You know, I think one of the there's been so many versions of this character. I can't tell you what my Netflix queue has been like. Yeah, for the I want to hear months. about your research. I mean, there's been so many. Well, you know, I think everybody has their version. Like mm -hmm. for me, it was Kiefer Sutherland oh, okay. in The Lost Boys. Oh yeah, that's kind of my that era. bald biker head in the beginning of that movie, <laughs> and I just I was that's a bloody for life. version. Yeah, very bloody. <laughs> And you know, there's been some really, the new Netflix one is great that just came out, although I was really annoyed that they actually found an actor whose last name is Bang to play Dracula while I'm playing it. It's really like, guys, it's so good. I mean, yeah. his name is Klaus Bang. Um, so there's, you know, there's a ton of really great source material to pull from. So the question is like, what direction do you go? And I think in terms of telling a feminist revenge story, the thing that's most fascinating about the vampires maybe now is that maybe that's just something that's in all of us all the time. And, you know, are we going to be able to solve these problems that we have with um, misogyny and gender and the patriarchy? Are we going to be able to figure these things out? Or is it just something that we all inherited, a kind of plague that's going to be a problem forever? And so I'm sort of, my Dracula is kind of representing that. So it's you a little more American psycho than monster. If that I love makes any that sense. because you could do dissertations on this. And <laughs> well, there have been many. Right? Yeah, yeah, right? Actually, yeah, and there absolutely have been people writing epic, epic stories about what it, what it means, the idea of consumption and all of those things. Right. And, Sure. But we've kind of locked it down to um, let's have a good amount of fun. Mm -hmm. Let's bite some people. Sure. Let's hiss at them. <laughs> and let's, uh, let's try to leave you with your partner in the Uber on the way home wondering if one of you is a vampire. Yeah. Oh, intrigue. Mm. Intrigue. All right, we're going to get to your questions in just a second. <laughs> but I want to hear more about your story. Tell me about where you're from and when you started performing. Wow. I grew up in a little town outside Pittsburgh. My mom was a drama teacher in a little high school, Jimmy Stewart's hometown, actually, Indiana, Pennsylvania. Indiana, Pennsylvania. Uh, very like It's a Wonderful Life, I think, <laughs> at a, in its best moments. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was the prop baby in all of the high, local high school productions. They passed you around. They would pass me around. They would set me on objects. They. Uh, <laughs> What yeah. were your early, what's your early work as a baby? You know, as early work, I think I did a great The King and I as one of 35 children. I think every child in the borough had to be in that show. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I also did a nice changeling in The Midsummer Night's Dream, which is not actually a character that ever appears, but they had me handy, so I would run across the they stage. They could have used a blanket, but I think they put me in a loincloth or something and <laughs> trotted around. Right. I've done a lot of that. And then I started, kind of discovered Shakespeare when I was in my 
early teens and really just fell in love with it. It felt like a, a kind of secret that I had found. I sort of found it before you're force fed it in school. Right. And I just found these crazy stories about kings and monsters and witches. And, and you understood the language enough. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing I love about Shakespeare is that I don't think anybody ever knew what the heck he was talking about. Yeah, we don't about. know what he's saying. I mean, if the man invented most of the English language, nobody ever knew what the heck he was saying. <laughs> so I love that about it, that it didn't make a ton of sense sometimes. And yet the stories crazy. shine through. Yeah, the stories shine through, and the language is so muscular and powerful and beautiful. And uh, that took me to university at the Guthrie Theater in mm -hmm. Minneapolis. Where you did 12 or so productions? Yeah, I did quite a lot of work there. Uh, right around the time they were opening this beautiful new theater that they opened, this three theater complex that they opened there and played Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby to open that theater, which was a great job and came to New York doing a production of Henry V that played at the New Vic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which was a great time. Mm -hmm. Lots of Shakespeare, yeah. but now you're a monster. <laughs> now I am All right, a monster. we're gonna take your questions. Yes. Great. All right. What so, first question is: Marty wants to know what has surprised you the most about this Dracula journey for you so far. Oh, well, it's interesting. You know, to be a little ticky tacky actor about it. You know, <laughs> the 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 real thing for a character is always sort of figuring out what they're afraid of. So when you're playing an immortal monster that eats all the people around him and is really, <laughs> really kind of unassailable, it becomes a challenge to figure out like what am I what am I afraid of mm. in in this moment in this story and. That's been really, really fun. It's a secret. I'm not going to tell I you. I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> but it's great. Those characters are so much fun to play. Those weird sort of supernatural, huge, huge people. And, you know, how, how much can you stretch your imagination to find it? Super fun. Amazing. All right. So Jack says that they noticed that both Dracula and Frankenstein are playing at, in, um, at, in rep. Mm -hmm. So that p some people would like some clarity on what that means. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, it's a great, you know, Classic Stage made a great decision for their season, which is really cool, which was to pair these two stories and try to get at what they might mean for us today. How could we reinvent both of these sort of iconic monsters? So there's a wonderful company doing Frankenstein of two actors directed by Timothy Douglas, who's a real hero of mine, and our company uh, uh, doing Frankenstein with the amazing Kate Hamill and Sarna Lapine, who's an incredible director, and Jessica Francis Dukes and Kelly Curran. And so we're appearing sort of on alternate nights. We have a little bit of a complicated schedule, but we're on the same set. And so you can come. And the set is by John Doyle. The set is by John Doyle. Artistic he's, director of CSC. He's a genius. It's so much fun to be sitting in a room with him. Um, yeah, and so you can come, take in one, take in both, and come and spend the day with us and sort of see uh, what these great minds are thinking about what these iconic monsters might mean today. Double mm -hmm. feature, double creature feature. Double creature feature, <laughs> Monster Squad. My other favorite movie when I was a kid. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, all right, so one last question, and yeah. a lot of people want to know, especially Alec wants to know, do you have any dream roles that you would oh like to do? Oh my gosh, you know, it would have been Dracula probably. Really? Maybe the mummy, I don't know. <laughs> Creature from the Black Lagoon. I mean, bring them all on. No, you know, I'm having a, a lot of fun at this point in my career kind of releasing that a little bit. I mean, mm. I've been so lucky to have played the parts in Shakespeare that I dreamed about when I was a little a little nugget in the hills of Pennsylvania. And so right now, it's really a, it's really a dream just to be around good people. Mm. I do like the monstrous stuff. The villains are really fun. Is there a Shakespeare villain you'd like to do in the future? Oh, you know, I suppose everybody wants to do Iago. I guess maybe Richard II I still want to play, mm -hmm. who's a little bit of a devious sort of character, very heartbreaking, but kind of devious. Iago would be really fun. I mean, there's so many, really. The serial killers are just great. I have an old <laughs> friend in this show, Kelly Kern, who I've known for 12 years, and I, I chase her around the stage, and she looks at me with such terror, and it's just... And you love it. The dream. Yes, it's fantastic. <laughs> Poor Mina Harker. Yeah, it's great. All right, well, guys, if that didn't sell you on this Dracula, I don't know don't what would. Go to Classic Stage Company, see Dracula, see Frankenstein, see Matthew Ament. Yeah. Ament. I got to say your name right. A Matthew, let's, let's school the people. Amen with a T. Amen with a T. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you guys so much. This is a blast. Kate, will you take us on out, please? Yes. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. We are live at 5 every single weekday here on Facebook, and you can listen to us where we get your podcasts by searching for hashtag live at 5 and hitting that subscribe button. Be sure to tune in tomorrow to talk to Thomas Schumacher of Disney Theatricals about all about his newest edition of his book, How Does the Show Go On?